I've known Pat a long time, and in fact, it was her roommate who actually became my wife, Linda Mayro, ultimately. So, mm -hmm. That's um, right. so I, I have a long and deep friendship with with Pat. Um, there were times back in those days when she would actually jump out of airplanes and parachute down to Earth. She's a little less adventuresome uh, these days. <laughs> Uh, but she graduated from uh, got, getting her master's degree from University of Arizona, then went on to uh, University of New Mexico. She's worked in Europe. She's obviously worked in the Mimbris area, continues to have uh, strong interest in sort of the, the southeastern part of Arizona, southwestern New Mexico. And I think what she's got to share with you tonight is going to be uh, an exciting uh, production. Again, without further ado, Pat Gilman. refrigerator magnet and it has a member's design on it. It has a couple people and I can't remember what else. Um, and I'm betting that many of you in the audience have things with member's designs, although I haven't seen any member's t-shirts come in tonight. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, napkins and tablecloths and t-shirts and refrigerator magnets. And why do we have those things? Why, it, why are member's designs so iconic? of the Southwest, of Southwestern archaeology. Are they cool? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. They're cool, they're cool. Um, when I first started working in the members, which since Bill gave a date, I will give the date of 1974. Ben Nelson was there with me. Peggy Nelson came the next year, another marriage. Um, and, and some of my uh, students who have graduated are back there, but they, they weren't there in the 70s. Um, I thought members pottery was nice, but I never found the designs compelling. You know, they were kind of flat and not very interesting to me. Um, and I know I'm sort of weird that way. It has taken <clears throat> almost 40 years for me to see things in the designs that I thought were interesting. Um, and it has taken the co uh, collaboration of two of my peers uh, to help out with this. One of them, and so I'm standing up here talking about this work tonight, talking with you. I'm hoping you're going to talk back to me. Um, but I couldn't be here if it weren't for Mark Thompson and his understanding of Mesoamerican iconography and Christina Wyckoff, one of my master's students, and her understanding of parrots and macaws. And so, Research doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, we, we academics and um, other professionals don't just sit at home and think up brilliant ideas. I, I, it's never worked for me. Um, so, tonight what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about the classic members period, which is 1000 to 1130. You're going to notice that it's a very short period of time. That's pretty interesting. Um, and I'm going to talk about the design, some of the designs on the pottery. Now, Mark and Christina and I have worked up these, these ideas I'm going to present to you tonight. Um, but you know they're not final. Um, one of the things that I think people out there in the real world, um, beyond academia uh, and professional archaeology, think is that we actually know facts, you know, and we tell you facts and you read facts, and that's just not true at all. These things, these ideas are evolving all the time as we get better data, as we have better thoughts, and sometimes our better thoughts come from comments that people make on our research. Um, and I'm not kidding when I say people like you. Um, ideas can come from lots of places, and so don't hesitate. I'm gonna ask you some questions, actually, in a while. There is gonna be a quiz here, um, but don't hesitate to make comments, um, ask questions, do whatever you want. Because um, we're supposed to talk here. So, okay, classic members. You all got handouts on your tables. I think there's not enough for every single person. But on the handouts, the first figure is a map there at the top. And for those of you who don't know where the members is, the members River is in southwestern New Mexico. Um, it flows from north to south. You can see it on here. And it flows out of the mountains and down into what my husband, uh, who's not here tonight, so I can <clears throat> make fun of him, um, euphemistically calls the stinking desert. 
It flows down into the basin and range topography, and it disappears into the desert. Along that Mimbris River, during the classic period, there were 12 or 13 big, um, yes, I have to stay behind the lights, um, which I find distracting because I can't see your faces, but no matter. Um, 12 or 13 big classic Mimbris Pueblos. Um, by Pueblos, you know what I mean. Surface rooms, not pit houses that came before, surface rooms that have contiguous walls, like our houses. The rooms in our houses have contiguous walls. The rooms in Pueblos have contiguous walls. These are probably the earliest Pueblos in the southern southwest. Um, there's some of the earliest Pueblos anywhere in the southwest. There are 12 or 13 large sites, and when I say large sites, I mean 100 rooms or more. At this point in time, that's a big site. Um, and the Mimbris River at that point that I'm talking about is only about 30 miles long. That's a lot of people. Regardless of how you count those people, that's a lot of people. Okay, so um, you know where the Mimbris is. There's a lot more to the Mimbris than the Mimbris Valley. The Mimbris, Mimbris sites, by which I mean sites that have 95 plus percent Mimbris pottery on them, uh, come over here into Arizona, a ways. They go down into Mexico, into Sonora and Chihuahua, a ways, a distance that we aren't sure of yet. They come east of the Rio Grande, quite a distance. And so there's a lot of member stuff out there, but that's not the focus of my talk tonight. The focus of my talk, um, my discussion with you, is members in the Members Valley, because that's where the spectacular stuff that catches our eye happens. I'm not sure it happens in those other places. It's another talk. Um, figure two here is one of the big member sites that I've been talking about, one of the 12 or 13. It's probably one of the two most important. It's the Galaz site. Um, it's got over 100 rooms, and this is a nice artist reconstruction in case um, you haven't seen what these sites might look like. Okay. Okay, so characteristic of this Mimbris Classic period, this 130-ish years or so, is the fanciest Mimbris pottery. There's some members pottery that comes before it. It's nice black on white pottery. It's not particularly eye-catching. Um, but if you look at the rest of the figures on your handout, you will see, I picked out, of course, some pretty spectacular pottery. So if you were an archaeologist working in the members area, what, and you were looking at this pottery, how would you think about this pottery? Here's your quiz. What would you say about it? Graphic. What do, hmm? very graphic. It's very graphic. Yes. We see, what, what do we see? We see black and white. white. They pick the two colors that would most let the designs pop off the background. You can't get two more contrasting colors than black and white. Um, so they clearly want you to look at this stuff. Huh? Um, OK. How, so you're looking at these pictures with people doing stuff. Um, how might you explain these things? What are we looking at here? What do you think? Action. Hmm? Action. You're looking at action? Are we looking at ordinary, everyday activities? Some of it, we might be. I haven't shown any of those in particular, I don't think. Unusual, yeah. And so what do archaeologists say when they see something they can't explain? It's ceremonial, it's ceremonial. yeah. <laughs> yep, you got it. Uh, so maybe we're looking at some ceremonial stuff here. Um, and maybe that's true. We're certainly looking at some things that don't appear in everyday life. I, I know that one of the previous speakers here wore a parrot hat for his talk. If you look at the, um, the bowl number four, you see two people wearing a fish hat. Um, but in everyday life, most of us don't wear fish hats. And so, um, hmm. okay. 
So, as I said, it finally dawned on me after almost 40 years that um, maybe the, there was some interesting stuff going on here. And it was when Christina and I heard a talk by Mark Thompson at a Muggy Own conference, and he showed the last picture I'm going to talk about, number eight, and we'll get to that. That is a stunning picture. Um, he showed that picture on the screen, on his PowerPoint, and Christina and I gasped. Uh, we were sitting next to each other, and, um, and, and his explanation of it, because when you look at it, it doesn't look like at least anything I knew anything about at the time. And I couldn't have explained what was happening in that picture. Um, uh, but Mark could. So the three of us have put together this scenario for explaining this kind of Mimbris art. Now, not all Mimbris pots are painted with people on them. In fact, very few are. And not all have even animals on them. If you look at picture number three, that's a geometric, classic black on white pot. It's a beautiful pot. Um, but it doesn't have people or animals. 60, 70% of all members' pots are geometric like that. They don't have people or animals on them. 30, 40%, depending upon what, where you're counting it, um, have people and animals and are called naturalistics. So I don't want you to think that every members' pot looks like the rest of these that I've shown here. Okay, so let me tell you what I think is happening here, what we think is happening. While I'm doing this, one of the things you might do is think about the weak points in this argument. This goes back to what I said earlier. A lot of times people who, don't, who aren't trained to think this way academically, um, who aren't professional archaeologists, they think, well, this is a great argument, and it must be true, because Pat Gilman stood up there and said it. Uh, if only my husband were here, he'd be rolling his eyes. Um, but we're always questioning what we're doing. We're always thinking, well, what if this isn't so? You know, what if I haven't interpreted this correctly? And of course, our peers are always saying, well, you know, I heard her talk, but it, it really doesn't go that way. And so one of my questions to you is, where, where are the weak points? I just have to stand here. Uh, where are the weak points in this argument? And what should I do next to make this argument stronger? OK, so here's the argument. In the AD 900s, thereabouts, um, no, let me start earlier. During this long pit house period, from about 200 AD to about 1000 AD, people are living in underground pit houses, pit structures. You know what those are. Do I need to explain them? OK. Um, and, um, and they're building huge ceremonial, communal gathering places, how, buildings called great kivas. Sometimes they get called something else. They get called communal structures or community structures. But I like great kivas. And they're big. They're just big pit houses. They're often 10 meters on a side, 10 yards on a side, um, sometimes bigger. Um, and they're huge. And they're so big that we think, although we don't have direct evidence, that people must have been gathering in those buildings for important community events, ceremonies, uh, <clears throat> religious things, you know, going back to the, if you can't explain it, it must be ceremonial. Um, and when they decommissioned one of those great kivas, they burned it, generally speaking. Most of these great kivas are burned. Um, it's like decommissioning a church today, desanctifying a church. There are certain rituals that must be done before it can be used for anything but a church. So very common to burn these great kivas. In the AD 900s, um, they burn the great kivas that they're decommissioning but they don't build any new ones. Um, so from the mid-900s on, pretty much we don't have any great kivas. So where are people doing their religious ceremonies, their community events? Hmm? Chaco. At Chaco. I like it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's a long way from members. And that's an interesting point. I'm going to go off on a tiny tangent. I promise it's just a tiny tangent. Um, because Chaco is happening at exactly the same time as classic members. Um, maybe a bit earlier, the big houses, the great houses start. But by 1130-ish, 1140-ish, Chaco is gone too, as we understand Chaco Canyon. Um, there is no relationship that we can see between Chaco and members. We can see archaeologically. That is, there's no Chaco ceramics in members. I know of one. Um, there's no member ceramics in Chaco. And that would be the easiest way for archaeologists to see those kinds of relationships. And we don't see them. They might be there, but we don't see them. OK, back to the regular part. Um, OK, so they're probably not hiking up to Chaco to do their religious ceremonies. Um, as great an idea as that is. So where are they doing them in the Mimbris Valley? In the plazas. Probably so. This is a place that um, these would be on figure number two there. You see the room blocks? And you see those empty places between the room blocks? Those, in theory, are plazas. And my colleagues have tried to convince me over the years that those really are, are plazas, places that people danced, held religious, public religious ceremonies. Um, the, the problem is, is what do you expect to see if you excavate a plaza? If you went to Hopi or Zuni today, I'm imagining many of you have been to a Pueblo, perhaps, and perhaps you've been fortunate enough to see a dance. Um, what would you expect to see if you um, excavated that plaza? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. If you were lucky, you might see a tamped down surface, right? Um, but would you see anything that indicated what people had done there and the important religious significance of that area? No. And so I remain unconvinced that these are plazas, but I have no idea where else people could have done these ceremonies because there are no other big buildings after uh, the mid to late 900s, 1000 AD. So, okay. So the religious buildings that had been so important for hundreds of years are gone and are not replaced by similar religious buildings. That's a pretty major change. Yeah. That's like burning all of the churches in Phoenix and not replacing them. That's a big deal. Um, OK. Here's the second thing that happens at, during the classic period, in this case, is the presence of scarlet macaws. Now, in that pit house period, there had been um, a couple of brightly colored birds that we have found that we have excavated. One is a thick-billed parrot. It's a very cute bird. It's very pretty. It's got bright green feathers. Um, it's not very big. Yeah, it's sort of like that. Um, and the second one was a military macaw. And they're big birds, but they're green. They've got a little blue and other colors around their faces, but they're green. Um, and they're not from very far away. They're from down into Sonora. Um, well, in fact, Thick-billed parrots used to live in southeastern Arizona. They tried to reintroduce them to the Chiricahua Mountains and failed. Um, but, and so they weren't from very far away. And military macaws were down in southern um, Chihuahua, Sonora. Scarlet macaws are big birds. Have you seen them? They're stunning birds. They are just stunning, um, especially if you see them I've never seen them in the wild, but I've seen them in Mexico in a zoo in a huge cage. And you see them against the green of the tropical rainforest. Um, they are bright red. They've got long, bright red tail feathers. And they're spectacular birds. Um, you might want one, you know, if you saw one. You might. But um, they're huge. They're from a long way away, too. The, the closest scarlet macaws are from about 700 miles away in the Huasteca on the east coast of Mexico. 
Okay, so you gotta get the scarlet macaws from the Huazteca up to the members somehow. How might you do that? Trade. Trade. That has been the standard. Uh, sorry, I'm going to pick on you, Ellie. Um, um, that's been the standard explanation for many years in the Southwest, is trade. And so what would you do? So I'm sitting in the Huazteca, and I'm, I'm breeding scarlet macaws, because uh, you can do that. And so I say to my, you, my cousin, 50 miles north, here, take this scarlet macaw. And my cousin says, great. Um, and then my cousin has it for a little while, and my cousin says to her cousin, oh, here, I've got this great scarlet macaw, take this. And it works its way north into the members, would be the standard explanation. Okay, have any of you ever kept a macaw in your house? Um, I had a friend who did, had a macaw, not a scarlet, but a macaw. Um, they would give the bird two by fours to chew up for fun. You don't carry an adult Scarlet macaw north anyway. Okay, how do you do it? When they're, when they're just born, they will bond to one human being. And so if you're the person who's feeding that macaw and taking care of it, it will bond to you. But you have to feed it every couple hours. You have to feed it, oh, a couple cubic centimeters of food every couple hours, and that food has to be at a certain temperature. It can't be too cold, and it can't be too hot. Um, yeah, they're little babies, and you know, they have no feathers, and they're really ugly. But if you do that, it will bond with you, and you could then bring it north, perhaps before it reached adulthood, because uh, you don't have any two by fours along the way that you're hauling along with you. Um, can you give that bird, once it's bonded with you, to your cousin 50 miles to the north? No, we don't think so, we don't think so. Um, it will not prosper, apparently. So, I think that down the line trade model doesn't work. So what is going to work? How are we gonna get those birds north into the members? And why would anyone do that? Hmm? Power, yeah. If you are the one who has the scarlet macaw, does that make you special? It makes you pretty special, I bet. I would think so, yeah. Could you take the eggs? Somebody asked me that recently, and, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so, um, because I think the egg would hatch before you got north, because you're walking 700 miles. Um, but th I thought that was an interesting question. Could you take the egg and let the bird hatch part way along, um, you know, solving some of the feeding issues? I don't know. And, and Mark knows a macaw breeder, and he needs to ask that question. Um, or you could have a hatchery at Casas Grandes Chihuahua. Now, the, the problem with that is that Casas Grandes starts in the middle 1200s. At Casas Grandes, at Pakime, where um, my husband Paul Minnis and Mike Whalen have been working now for many years, they do breed parrots, but it starts later in time. They breed macaws. When I say parrots, I often mean macaws. Um, but it starts later in time. And we don't know of anybody breeding scarlet macaws in the Southwest until that time, until 1250 or later. Um, that isn't to say there isn't anybody, but we don't have any evidence, and we've been working on evidence like this for 100 years. Um, keep going. Okay. How else are we going to get those macaws north and why? Kill them. Kill them. Um, we could. We could. Because what they really want, apparently, we think, is those long tail feathers. But it looks like what happens is the macaws are in the Mimbris and at Chaco, and most of them are killed a year after they have been born. They're born in March and April. They are sacrificed when they're between 11 and 13 months old. And so, Char McCusick has suggested that they're sacrificed for the spring equinox, and perhaps they're sacrificed for the red tail feathers. Because at that point, they're fully fledged. They've got the adult-sized red tail feathers. They can't reproduce at that point, they're too young, but they've got the adult tail feathers. 
And so they may not kill them to bring them north. You might ask, well, why don't they just get the tail feathers and bring the tail feathers north? And I don't know the answer to that. But, um, but they do sacrifice most of the birds um, that we find, both in Chaco and in um, Mimbris. Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't know when they do it. That's my understanding, too, um, that certain birds are raised for sacrifice in some or all of the Pueblos. Um, and certainly, there is an interest among Puebloan people um, in um, colored bird feathers. Um, and I think red is especially important, because um, red is symbolic of either the east or the south. There's something else. Uh -huh. Oh. And uh, there were five or six of them. They'd, uh, they'd been trained, so evidently they were bonded. Uh -huh. One windy day, one of them got blown away to the zoo. But they got over and got it, and they, they would come back. Uh -huh. They yeah. would set them yeah. free flight. They weren't tied to anything, uh -huh. and they would come back. But yeah. they obviously had bonded. Yeah, I yeah. I think that, that must be the case. Them. Yeah. But, oh, they're they are beautiful. They are beautiful. Yeah, they're um, floating. They're kind of floating. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've still got to get the macaws north to the members. Pochtecas. Yeah, they come a little later. Um, but, but I think what we are talking about is we are talking about individual people um, bonding with the birds and coming north. Now, whether those people are from our Waztecans coming north to members, or whether those people are from the members valley, members region, and they go south to the Huazteca, get the parrots, get the birds, and then they come north, we don't know. Although Harry Schaefer, at one of the big classic member sites, does, did some DNA analysis. I think that's what it was. One of those kinds of compositional analysis on human bones. And there are a couple of women at that site who are from northern Durango, Zacatecas area. That's not the Huazteca, but it's farther south in Mexico by a chunk of miles. So, um, okay. So I think, Mark, Christina, and I think that what's happening is that people are either going south for these birds for religious purposes, not for trade, but for religious purposes, getting the birds coming north or people are coming north with the birds. Again, it's all wrapped up in religion stuff. Okay, let me give you the third piece of the puzzle then. The third piece of the puzzle is the iconography on the members bowls. Um, the images on some of the members bowls that we, we can identify this on some of the members bowls, not on all of them. Um, and that is iconography from the Hero Twin Saga as written down in the Popol Vuh and the Popol view is Mayan, and it um, is the Mayan cosmology, the Mayan origin story, among other things, and the Mayan cosmology. And so, this is Mark's research, um, and I'm understanding parts of it, um, but, you know, I don't know as much as he knows. So, let's look at bowl number four here. There are three things I'm going to, three examples I'm going to use tonight to demonstrate to you why we think we're seeing iconography shared with Mesoamerica on Mimbris bowls, okay? Look at bowl number four. What we see here is we see the hero twins themselves. The hero twins are, um, they have a miraculous birth. They are killed by the gods. They are reincarnated. And they eventually become, in the Popol Vuh, the moon and the star, the sun and the moon, still with us today. Um, and there are certain attributes of the hero twins that we see in some human figures on members bowls that makes Mark, and now me, and Christina, think, and other people, other people have thought this, other archaeologists have thought this as well, um, that these really are the hero twins. Okay, so here on bowl number four, you have two people. Right? The one on the left is a little bit bigger. And that's um, the elder twin is supposed to be bigger. He's supposed to be right-handed. Um, 
His avatars are deer and the sun. Okay. So we have, just a second. Okay. We have the larger twin. His right hand is out, perhaps signifying he's right-handed. We don't see anything else there. The second person is there. Um, his left hand is out, perhaps signifying he's left-handed, and he is smaller there. Um, so Mark would say that this, these are the hero twins here, portrayed on a member's vessel at least 700 miles from anybody who used the hero twins cosmology. And they're wearing a fish hat, which I like a lot. Um, let's, we'll come back to the fish hat in just a second. Let's look at bowl number five. Okay, so we've got here, we've got two people. They're two men, clearly. Um, the larger man has a larger arm. I would say that's his right arm. The smaller man has also has a larger arm. I would say it's his left arm. You can't really tell. But I think anybody looking at this who knew the cosmology would instantly know which twin was which. And they're doing something with a catfish that has some anthropomorphic cat, um, characteristics. The legs, right? OK. So this is part of the hero twin saga. This is part of the narrative. This is one of the scenes, if you will, in the saga. And this is where the gods have killed the hero twins. But before they killed the hero twins, the hero twins said to the gods, um, OK, you can kill us. That'll be fine, whatever. But we want you to grind up our bones and throw them in the river. And the gods say, sure, fine, whatever. So the gods kill the hero twins. They grind up the bones. They throw them in the river. The hero twins become fish in the river. And in the Popol Vuh and in Mayan and other Mesoamerican iconography, fish are the souls of the dead in the watery underworld. Think about that the next time you have fish. Anybody eating fish here tonight? <laughs> nah. Um, and eventually, the fish transform, reincarnate, if you will, from being fish to being young boys again. And we think that this particular painting shows that transformation. They are transforming from being fish to being young boys. OK. If you go back to figure number four with the fish hat, um, what is being shown here? We've, we know we've got the, well, we, I know. I think we know. We've, we've got the hero, hero twins. Why are they wearing a fish hat? Protection. We think they've conquered death, right? They've conquered the watery underworld. They've been reincarnated as young boys, as who they were. And we think that wearing a fish hat is the way you show, one of the ways you show that you've conquered death. I like it. Um, so possible. I mean, it's possible, too, that, there, that this is some sort of supernatural protection. That's a good idea that I hadn't thought of. OK. OK, let me show you a couple more pictures. Here's another episode from the Hero Twin Saga that we think is shown on Member's Bow. If you look at the bear, the Hero Twins go through a whole bunch of adventures where they're um, they, they conquer monsters, and they kill monsters, and they do all that stuff that heroes are supposed to do. Think Greek mythology. It's the same sort of thing. Um, one of the monsters is, yes? Which one is the bear? OK, number six. I thought that was an armadillo. <laughs> um, we don't think so. Were there armadillos in the Southwest at this point? I don't think there were. I think armadillos are a fairly recent um, introduction into the United States. I'm from Oklahoma. I should know this, but <laughs> they're certainly in Oklahoma. Yeah, we think it's a bear. Can't tell you why. Um, so one of the monsters they kill eventually is is a monster called Seven Macaw, and Seven Macaw is either shown as a monstrous bird or is shown as a bear. So if you look at this, you've got a bear and an arm, right? So the twins go to kill Seven Macaw the first time, and they fail. 
Seven Macaw instead rips off the arm of the elder twin. Um, okay, and so we've got a bear, Seven Macaw, and we've got an arm. If you move to pot number seven, what have we got? We've got a human figure with a bear, right? Okay. And where are the human figure's fingers? Nose, eyes, at, at the bear's face, right? In the Popol Vuh story about the killing of seven macaw, the younger twin goes back to get his brother's arm um, so it can be reattached, which it is eventually, by the way. Um, and in doing so, he pokes the eyes out, seven macaw's eyes out. Number seven, right here. Um, that's the younger twin poking the eyes out of seven macaw, we think. Um, how else do you explain that severed arm thing there with the bear? Um, okay. So, there's a number of others we could talk about, but hopefully that's enough to convince you that perhaps we're on the right track here. Let's look at number eight, which is, in my mind, the most spectacular of the hero twins pots. So what do we got? You see the, who's the larger twin? You see the larger person there, right? Okay. Um, which arm of his is larger? His right arm, yeah. And so that's the elder twin. Um, what is on the stick in front of him? A head of something, a deer? His feet are on an antelope. Okay. Antelopes have twins, right? Often have twins, often bear twins. And they are seen, as, both deer and antelope are seen in general as symbols of the twins themselves. Um, but what specifically is the avatar of the elder twin? Deer. Okay, so he's got a deer head on a stick there. Okay, the younger twin is behind. Um, and in his left arm is his avatar, which is a, I didn't tell you this, but it's a rabbit. The younger twin is the rabbit in the moon. You know, many Native Americans see a rabbit in the moon instead of a man in the moon. Um, and um, and his, his avatar is the rabbit, and he's holding on to the rabbit. What is the elder twin wearing as a hat? It's a, a stork, it's, it's the bird of doom, and it's got a fish in its mouth. And again, he's wearing that as a hat, uh, suggesting that they have conquered death, according to Mark. And Mark thinks that this is the end of the hero twin saga, where they rise, they have come out of the underworld, they're human again, um, and they are rising into the heavens to become the sun and the moon. Um, that's just a wonderful pot. Okay. So, what do we think has happened? We think they torched the great kivas. Um, the great kivas are gone. They're not replaced. And they get this religion, <coughs> this iconography, that's Mesoamerican, that they ultimately share with Mesoamerica. We think it comes with the scarlet macaws. We can't prove that. But we think it's coming with the scarlet macaws. We think that in order to own a scarlet macaw, to take one out of the Huasteca, that you've got to have the proper both training in what to feed it and how to keep it alive. But you've also got to have the proper religion in your head, that you can't just take one of these birds as an ordinary person without proper religious training, that you have to have uh, that religious understanding, and that's what they're painting on the bowls, at least in part, is that shared iconography. Um, so we think the scarlet macaws and the iconography are coming as a package uh, north uh, into the members. Okay. Now, there are lots of questions you could ask about all of that. Um, because I don't have a lot of evidence for parts of what I said, of course. And because there's lots of implications of what I just said. So, let's try it. 
I have the mic. I'll oh. bring to if you want, want to raise your hand. Second. David, they'll be right there. You spoke about the absence of membranes in, um, up north, but is membranes found down south where the scarlet macaws are? No, no. As far as I know, I know very little about the Huasteca. Ben, do you know? No, I don't either. I've never heard of any members being that far south. Um, that's a good question. Um, because that might suggest then that it's people from the Huasteca coming north. Now, then the other question that goes with that is is there anything Huastecan besides the parrots and the iconography in the members? Is there any pottery or anything? And the answer is no. Not that we know of. I think we would have seen it. Have you looked at Mayan pots to see if you have any of the same types of icons there? Good question. Mark has looked extensively at my Mayan pots because, you know, the Popol Vuh comes out of the Mayan area. And so, um, and, if, and the hero twins are shown, and all the episodes are shown, but it's a very different iconography, it's a very different style of painting. Would you expect that as this material comes north, that the members people would be passive and just say, oh, God, this is so cool. We're going to paint it just like that, just like the Mayan stuff. No. They're taking it, we think, and they're making it their own. They're making it members. Um, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to wait and see if any of you ask me that question. Um, and so we wouldn't necessarily expect it to look Mayan. But yeah, you see the same things in mine and in other um, uh, Mesoamerican. And in fact, the hero twins are kind of pan-American in some ways. You see aspects of them um, across North America, and I think across South America, too. Do you see any connections with Inca? Because they've got a lot of birds. In, uh, I don't think anything's happening. The Inca, yes. uh, there's a lot of big birds and condors. and. Uh, pots with rather interesting things on them that are unlike everybody else's. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You're way beyond my knowledge there. Good question. Um, we spent a little bit of time studying with the Hopi and Navajo, and they said that in their history, in the Hopi, they said that the, in their history, their clans moved up from South America and Mexico and traveled into the Southwest. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's very easy to think that they moved the birds along with them mm -hmm. um, as they moved. And it also, in looking at some of the, the drawings on the pottery, I see commonalities with mm -hmm. some of the fetishes, fetish images that we mm -hmm. see today. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the bears, um, particularly, it looks Good similar point. to um, number seven. The fish is a very strong fetish mm -hmm. among um, the native tribes. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, you know, clearly it would seem to me that there are, you know, commonalities in history and, and migration. Yes. And among Puebloan peoples today, um, the hero twins are part of their cosmology, are part of their understanding of the origins of the universe, and, um, but they're called the war twins. Um, and so again, they've been taken and modified to fit the needs of people here rather than people in the Huasteca or people in the Mayan area. Um, the Hopis speak a Udo Aztecan language that there's a lot of debate among linguists about where that originated. And for a long time, many linguists thought, and some still do, and I, I don't know which is right or wrong, that Udo Aztecan came out of central Mexico. And it came north with corn agriculture which would be pretty early. It would be um, 2000 BC-ish, well, to about 1 AD maybe, you know, in that range. It's pretty murky. Um, but that's much before this. And so, but now a lot of linguists think that uto aztecan languages came out of the Great Basin, Nevada, of all places, went down to Mexico and popped back up. Um, so, um, Mm. Let me bring That's the microphone. Just a second, you've got to get a, a microphone. That's certainly a very interesting concept, and if you talk to some of the Hopi archaeologists, they believe that this, the snake clan of the Hopis is related to Quetzalcoatl mm -hmm. from Central mm -hmm. America. Yeah. 
But then how do you explain the Zunis? Where did the Zunis come? They speak an isolate language, and they share a lot of the Puebloan uh, mm -hmm. uh, culture. I don't know whether they have the hero twins, but they speak an isolate they language. So where twins. do they come from? <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, for a long time, some archaeologists have thought that what happens to people who lived in the Mimbris Valley and who were Mimbris, because what is Mimbris in the Mimbris Valley pretty much becomes something else after 1130. Um, they think that ultimately people from the Mimbris area came to Zuni and at least in part became part of what was Zuni. Um, it's fascinating to think that the Zuni language might have been the Mimbris language, but we can't make those connections. Um, you know, um, we don't have ev that kind of evidence. I'll be right there. <laughs> uh, you talked about the destruction of the great kivas. At, tell me about the ball courts. Did they have ball courts? I know there are 200 or so in Arizona. Right. How about right. these people? Um, we don't think so. We have not found any, except that Steve Lexon thinks that there's a ball, who's a member's archaeologist, among many other things, thinks that there's a ball court at a site on the Gila River to the west of members. You know, Mem the members River is running north and south. The Gila River to the west comes out of the mountains and flows west and flows into Arizona. Well, I think I saw a pot that showed some guys playing ball on it. One of the members things. Yeah. Sure, could be, but they didn't necessarily use a ball court. Okay. Um, yeah, we, don't, don't. we don't see ball courts. Many of us have walked on the Woodrow site where Steve thinks there's a ball court and we're not seeing much. Um, but you'd have to put some test trenches in to see. Well, they sure. disappeared around that same period of time yes, in they Arizona, did. right? Yes, they did. And in fact, the whole calm, um, at about the same time, um, things change from ball courts and pit structures, houses built in pits, to platform mounds and uh, compounds, houses and compounds. I, I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> because we don't see, at this point in time, much relationship between members and whole town. There's a little bit of relationship earlier on. I'm not very convinced about, you know, that it was very deep and wide, but but there is some. Uh, the, I remind you all that, you know, the stuff you read in books um, and the stuff that I tell you and all of that sort of thing is all well and good, but it's changing all the time. And there are all these questions out there that are good questions that we don't have answers to because there aren't enough archaeologists to be thinking about them and to be working on them. Um, I don't know that the world needs a lot more archaeologists, but... <laughs> Uh -oh. hey, hey, Pat? Yeah. So how many people are you in, in your model, how many people are you thinking are taking this information up? And I know this is probably going too far, but, and like, are they per village? You anticipate a couple per village, or how, oh. how do you, or you haven't thought that far? <laughs> no, no, we have, but we don't dare to put it in our paper because the reviewers did not like this because there's no evidence at all, and Paul keeps saying, take that out. You don't have any evidence. Um, and we don't. Um, if you look, though, at classic member sites, at the big Pueblos, or any Pueblo, there are 11 or 12, yeah, 11 or 12-ish macaws. Some of them, we can't tell if it's a scarlet or a military. Some of them, whoever did the analysis, because the, a lot of the analyses were done in the 1930s, some of them, they just didn't know to look, you know. Um, and so one of the things I'd really like to do is get hold of those macaw skeletons and parrot skeletons and do a little DNA analysis, which wouldn't be very destructive, um, and see what we've really got. There are 20 or 21 parrots and macaws from the members. Two of them date to the late pit house period. Um, the rest date to the classic period. Uh, we know five or six of them are, are really scarlets, but the rest of them we aren't sure what we've got, um, unfortunately. I've, I'm betting most of them are scarlets. Um, just a second, I lost. Ah, so of all of those 20 or 21 birds, 11 or 12 of them 
11 to 12 are from the Galaz site, from one site. That site pictured there on the front page of the handout, the little Pueblo drawing. Um, it suggests Galaz, because Galaz has had a lot of excavation, but it suggests Galaz is really important, which we think it is for a number of reasons. Um, that it's one of the two most important classic member sites in terms of religion um, and ceremonies. Um, most classic sites, we don't really have any of these exotic, brightly colored birds from, although we may have other birds like hawks. Um, nobody has put together a, a spreadsheet of all the birds that you wouldn't eat necessarily, you know, we're not, t and, and that are big, you know, no sparrows, um, that are found from archaeological sites in the members area. It'd be a fascinating thing to do. Um, so we don't think everyone gets a scarlet macaw. We don't think every site gets a scarlet macaw, but we could be wrong. You know how much potting there has been, pot hunting, in member sites. Um, but, so I can't really say any of those things, but our gut level feeling is not everybody gets one, and that they are pretty special. Um, and so, you know, if you've only got 17 or 18 of the birds, not counting the two early birds that come from closer, could, could it have been just one trip down to the Huasteca? Or one time Huastecans came up and brought, you know, all those little babies that they're feeding carefully? I don't know. Or did people go regularly um, as some sort of religious pilgrimage? Um, to, to get religious knowledge that was important to them? Don't know. Interesting stuff. Bob. Uh, a related question. Um, I noticed the, the photos don't have uh, the Praveen's of the bowls. Uh -huh. Are these specific bowls that relate to Mayan Popol Vuh, are they coming from all the Pueblo sites, or are they also concentrated at just a few of the bigger sites. We don't and then know. What, if they are, what might that mean? We don't know. If you want a research project, that would be a good one. <laughs> um, and that's one of the things that we would like to do kind of next is figure that out. Um, there are about 125 bowls that have human figures on them. Now, I got to tell you that there are about probably seven, eight, maybe 9,000 members classic painted bowls. So 125 is not very many. So one of the questions you might be asking is, what are they doing on the rest of those bowls, Pat? You know, you have a less strong argument given that there are only 125 and there's no guarantee that in all of those 125 that they're all hero twins story, part of the hero twin story. We don't know that. And so that's a, a project um, coming up. I missed part of your question, though. Did I? Oh, that was your question. Okay. Okay. I have a connected question. Uh-huh. Just a second. Hold on. Do you see the designs on anything other than pottery? Are there any mm -hmm. petroglyphs or any other kind of artifacts that you yes. find these? Yes. Yes. Um, there are members' petroglyphs, and there are members' petroglyphs that have parrots or macaws on them. Some of them are pretty spectacular. I know of one in Pony Hills where the, it looks like a macaw, and it's that big. Um, it's pretty cool. Now, then the question is, uh, again, nobody's done this research, how many of the images can be related to the Popol Vuh? How many are related to something else? Many, of course, we aren't going to be able to tell, I suppose. Um, there's a lot, a lot, relatively speaking, of members petroglyphs that have Tlaloc images, T-L-A-L-O-C, which is the rain god in Mexico, among other things. And, um, and you don't see those on members' pottery. So how many of the images only occur on petroglyphs? How many only occur on the pottery? What images occur on both? What kind of patterns would we get if we did that analysis? Another analysis that has never been done, that's just waiting for somebody to do. You, yeah. It's uh, working its way to you. Well, to a certain extent, you're, you're talking about cross-cultural interaction here, I think. And again, I'm remembering our guide, uh, the Hopi Mesas, said that in their tradition, the clans arrived one at a time. They didn't just a whole bunch of mm -hmm. people. The clans arrived one at a time, and in fact, they were asked, what can you contribute mm -hmm. to the group? And then they, would, they might be to join the mm -hmm. other group. So, and 
I've said they came up from the south, mm -hmm. probably. Um, in more modern times, we live next to the Gila River community. I think it's the Pima mm -hmm. who came from all, they were the, from the river tribes, and they like ran from there, and they said, can we come in and live with you? Mm -hmm. Called. Right, right. Um, and, and, and it's possible, I think it's highly likely, that some of this stuff I've been talking about does contribute to modern Pueblo um, cosmology, understanding of the way the world works in the universe. Um, but I don't think that's all that contributes to modern Pueblo understandings. I, um, I see one problem, and he mentioned it back uh -huh. there. Um, you're saying that there's so many thousand pots and a certain percent are these images. Uh -huh. When I was exploring some areas around Three Rivers and some of the member sites and the Deming Luna Museum, uh -huh. there's an awful lot of stuff out there that has no provenience. And my understanding is saying. that heavy duty, the members' uh, ruins have been pot hunted, and a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. is on the black market and it's yep. in Japan. So and we're Germany. missing, or Germany too, oh, yeah. we're missing an awful lot yeah. of stuff that we could be yes. using as part of it. So yes. we really don't have a true picture of how yes. many there were. And that's what I meant to say when Bob asked me the question about member's pots. Um, do we know what sites they're from? And the answer is, although we have a photographic archive that now numbers over 10,000, not all of them are painted and not all of them are precisely members. Um, but, so that's why I say seven, eight, nine thousand painted members' pots. Um, the provenience on those, the places they came from are often unknown. Often it will say, uh, from a private collection. And it won't say what site, much less what room or room block or anything else there. And so we have no idea. That last pot I showed you, that spectacular one with the two twins rising up into the heavens, private collection, no provenience. Steve LeBlanc thinks it's a fake. Um, I hate that idea. Um, I don't think it's a fake because I think most people who fake pots wouldn't know the Popol Vuh that well to be able to paint that particular image. I could be wrong. Maybe there's a really good fake painter of members' pots out there. Um, but um, anyway, there are so many of these pots, though, that I, I think are, are uh, Explanation holds, even if one of more of these pots is a fake. I'm hoping it's not. But that's a real problem. And my pitch to you as an archaeologist, and I know you know this, I know I'm preaching to the choir, um, but I'm compelled to say this, is don't buy artifacts. When you buy an artifact, a projectile point, a beautiful fulsome uh, spear point, a member's pot, even if it's a crappy one, you're fueling the market. And you're letting some pot hunter know, well, I could go out and dig up some more because I just sold this one. Um, and so we lose so much information uh, when that happens that would contribute to these kinds of arguments um, that we're trying to make that I think are pretty interesting. This says a lot about human behavior, um, about human beings walking 700 miles one way to get some little scrawny featherless birds that you have to feed every two hours. I mean, even if it wasn't that, just the walk itself is an amazing feat, in my mind, so to speak. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's important to recognize that people in the past did some pretty amazing things. We know that, but uh, it's still important to recognize that. There's time for a couple more questions, and I'll just, I'll be right up there. <laughs> All these pots are whole. Mm -hmm. Have they been reconstructed? Um, I don't know. Sometimes um, gluing them back together is so good you can't tell in a picture like this. Be because um, most of the pictures I've seen of members pottery are whole. Yeah. They have been killed? Ah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And these are oh, all whole. Now, that I don't know. Um, I have a master's student right now working on kill holes. You know that um, many of these pots, but not all of them, were placed in burials over the person's face. Um, we have tried to figure out 
what goes with what? You know, do kids get some kinds of pots? Do men get some kind? Do women get some kind? Doesn't sort out very well at all. But often the, we call them being killed. We don't know what people who did it would have thought. A hole is poked into the pot. Um, and, but not all pots have a kill hole. But I have a student trying to figure out if there are any patterns. Um, do geometrics get more kill holes and naturalistics get less? Um, do you women get more kill hole, kill pots than men or kids than adults? Uh, she's finding no patterns. She's finding no patterns. So um, there must be patterns, but we haven't done an analysis that will show us yet. Hi, uh, going back to the scarlet macaws, would there have been a way to incapacitate the birds to transport them? Like? Like drugs, ether, you know, I don't know what they yeah. do with birds. I don't know. Um, when I gave uh, another version of this talk in September, um, apparently somebody sitting back near Paul said, well, you just toss them into a bag and you carry them north. And, um, but we're making the case, and apparently I didn't make it well enough that night, um, that that is not what you do, that they're just nasty birds, and um, they're not just, they're not going to tolerate being in a bag carrying them north. Um, so I don't know. I wish I knew more about macaws, actually. There's some back here. How do you think the... Uh Three bowls that have uh, human sacrificial images on them fit into this. They have a serpent headdress. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of those. There's a couple of those. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's part of the Hero Twin saga. Um, or I was um, with Joe Sweena, um, Dr. Joe Sweena, who is Coach de Pueblo, um, in May doing a tour. And we saw one of those bowls in the Western New Mexico University Museum. And he looked at it for a while and he said, hmm, um, that person who's doing the sacrifice must have been very sad yeah. that, um, that the person being killed is being killed because they had been very bad in the Pueblo and that the Pueblo had gotten together and said, we can't deal with this person anymore. This person has to be killed. And the person selected to do the killing um, would have been very sad about this. And if you read Pueblo and ethnographies, that does happen. That, you know, in small communities, if you're a bad person, they'll tolerate that for a long time. But ultimately, they're going to say, you know, we've had enough of this. Um, and we can't live this way anymore with this person. Um, it was pretty direct. And so Joe would have another explanation of that that was um, rooted in Puebloan history and, and had little to do or nothing to do with the Popol Vuh and the Hero Twins. So I don't know what the answer is. There are other explanations, of course, for these things, I suppose. So um, without spending another 40 years looking at 10,000 <laughs> pots or finding them, how would one go about analyzing those designs? What would you need to do? Where would you find that information? Um, Steve LeBlanc, the mentor of several of us in this room, um, put together this member's archive that I've talked about, um, pictures of all the member's pots he can get his hands on. Uh, he checks eBay every week. Uh, he adds pots to the archive. And it's available electronically to us researchers. And I would start there. And I would, for example, call up all 125, you can put in things you want to see, human figures, and get them to come up. And then I would start looking to see how many I could relate to the Popol Vuh. Actually, I'd try to get a grad student to do that. <laughs> um, but, but my point is, is, you know, often a lot of the really hot ideas come from young people you know, who have just gotten their PhD or are about to get their PhD. And they're right there on the cutting edge. They've read all of the most recent stuff. Um, and, and that is true. But sometimes, and maybe I'm just slow, but sometimes it really does take a long time working with the stuff to see and being fortunate enough to have heard that particular paper on that particular day 
and not have to have been in the bathroom at that point, um, or out drinking a beer, and um, you know, and to have things click in your head. Um, sometimes us older people really do have wisdom, knowledge. I don't know. Anyway, you young ones can remember that. I don't think. Accuse Pat of being slow. Thank you so much, Pat. Can we all give her a hand?